good morning, everyone. I'm Matt Mills, and joining me in the commentary box is Natalie Pratt. Good morning, Natalie. Good morning. Natalie and I are junior barristers at Radcliffe Chambers who specialise in charity law, among other things. First up to bat is Natalie. She'll be talking to you about the Commission's protective powers. After that, I'll be talking to you about how to deal with uncertain or failed charitable legacies in wills. I'll hand you over to Natalie. Okay. Well, as Matt says, I'm warming up the crowd before the headline act makes his appearance. Uh, and I'm talking this morning about the Commission's uh, protective powers. Um, so hopefully we are all familiar with the Commission's functions that are listed at section 15 of the Charities Act 2011. Uh, and the third of those functions uh, is to identify and investigate apparent misconduct and mismanagement in the administration of charities and take remedial or protective action in connection with misconduct or mismanagement in the administration of charities. Uh, and so today I'm looking at the Commission's statutory uh, protective powers, which are there to help achieve that third function. Now, uh, I'm going to look at this topic mostly through the lens uh, of a particular protective power, and that's the appointment of interim managers. Um, however, a lot of what I'm going to say uh, will equally apply to the other protective powers uh, and where there's some crossover that's not obvious, uh, I will flag it for you. Um, so the overview, what are we going to be looking at? Uh, three things broadly. Firstly, uh, what are the Charity Commission's protective powers? Secondly, when can those protective powers be exercised? Uh, and thirdly, how you might go about appealing the Commission's exercise of its protective powers. Uh, now, as to saying to Matt before the webinar started, I appreciate I mostly sit here telling you uh, or, or, or suggesting how you might try uh, an appeal or challenge commission decisions. Uh, my talks always seem to be quite litigious and combative. Uh, so next year, I promise I will do something uh, less litigious and perhaps more uh, advisory and of general interest. So the commission's protective powers, what are they? So the Charities Act 2011, uh, all the subheadings contained therein, uh, indicate that sections 75A through to 87 uh, contain the provisions that relate uh, to the powers of the Commission to act for the protection of charities. Um, now I'm mostly focusing on section 76 today, and 76 uh, contains the powers uh, to suspend uh, trustees and also to appoint interim managers, uh, amongst other powers. Um, but there are at least four other sections uh, that you'll want to be aware of uh, and that you should keep an eye on. Uh, so the first of those is section 79, that uh, contains the Commission's power to remove trustees. Um, and actually the exercise of that power relies on the same preconditions uh, as the exercise of the powers in section 76. So the things that I'll say about section 76 and those preconditions will apply equally uh, to section 79. Uh, 79A is also important to know about, uh, so that relates to the removal uh, of disqualified trustees, uh, section 80, that contains other miscellaneous powers to approve, uh, approve, remove or appoint trustees. Um, that includes things like removing trustees where your trustee uh, is bankrupt, uh, or if your trustee is a corporation where your, uh, incorporation, where your corporation is in liquidation. Uh, and also if you've got a trustee who is incapable of acting uh, by reason of a mental disorder as defined by the Mental Health Act 1983. Uh, and finally, section 84B, so big B, amended section. Keep an eye on this because that is where the Commission's power to direct a winding up derives from. Um, and again, that has the same preconditions, at least in part, as section 76. Uh, so the things that I'll be saying about section 76 uh, apply equally uh, to 84B. Um, so I'm looking, as I've said, mostly at section 76, uh, and section 76, subsection 3 contains the protective powers that can be exercised if you meet the preconditions in section 76.1. And we'll look at the preconditions uh, from 76.1 in a moment. Um, and I do apologize because the next three slides contain lots of text. Um, I will try and paraphrase, but I'm probably just safer if I read it to you. Um, so under 76.3, the commission may of its own motion do one or more of the following. And I'll warn you now, it goes up to G. So we've got a little way to go. So you can, by order, suspend any person who is a trustee, officer, agent, or employee of the charity from the office or employment, 
pending consideration being given to the person's removal, whether that be under section 79 or section 80, so the two sections I've just mentioned, or otherwise. Uh, B, the Commission may uh, by order appoint such number of additional trustees as it considers necessary for the proper administration of the charity. Uh, C contains vesting provisions, so by order, uh, vest any property held by or in trust for the charity in the official custodian, require the persons in whom any such property is vested to transfer it to the official custodian, or three, uh, appoint any person to transfer any such property to the official custodian. Uh, sub D provides uh, order any person who holds any property on behalf of the charity or of any trustee for it, not to part with the property without the approval of the commission. So we can see the subsections in the middle here are dealing with uh, protecting charity's property. E, order any debtor of the charity not to make any payment in or towards the discharge of the debtor's liability to the charity without the approval of the commission. F, uh, by order restrict, regardless of anything in the trust of the charity, the transactions which may be entered into or the nature or amount of the payments which may be made in the administration of the charity without the approval of the commission. Uh, and then the one uh, which I will be looking at mostly today, 76.3G. Uh, so by order, appoint in accordance with section 78, an interim manager to act as receiver and manager in respect of the property and affairs of the charity. Uh, so 76.3G then refers us over to section 78. Now, section 78 contains the supplementary provisions uh, relating to the appointment of interim managers. Uh, and I've picked out a few of those important provisions uh, and put them on the slide. Don't worry, I won't read all of section 78 as well as 76. Uh, it's too early in the morning for that. Um, now, your interim manager will usually be uh, a solicitor, uh, a chartered accountant, uh, or an insolvency practitioner who has particular expertise uh, and experience uh, in the charity sector. Uh, and they are selected by the commission, usually, uh, I think, if not exclusively, from the panel or the pre-approved panel uh, by the commission. Uh, so what happens is the commission will put out to tender uh, the particular position with a description of the role and invite bids uh, from those who are interested in taking the office. Um, now, 78 provides that orders made under 76.3G may make provision with respect to the functions to be discharged by the interim manager. So here we see that the commission can set specific tasks for an interim manager on their appointment. And so that might be, be uh, particular things that the commission wants uh, investigated or reviewed by the interim manager. So it might be they want a review of say, the governing documents of the charity uh, or the accounting records, or they can set specific tasks. So perhaps securing uh, the property of the charity or bringing what would otherwise be an insolvent charity perhaps back into solvency. Um, the interim manager's functions uh, or the discharge of their functions are supervised by the commission. Uh, so your interim manager uh, is an independent office holder, but in, in much the same way as the trustee is, uh, but also in much the same way as the trustee, uh, the commission is supervising the discharge of those functions. Uh, and importantly, Section 78 also provides that your 76.3G order may provide for the interim manager to have the powers and duties of the charity's trustees, or the powers and duties that are specified in the order, and for those powers and duties to be exercised or performed to the exclusion of the trustees. Uh, and this is, can be the real teeth uh, in an interim manager appointment, because the trustees can be excluded from the control and the day-to-day -day running of the charity without actually being suspended uh, or removed. Um, and actually those teeth can be quite sharp because your usual uh, interim manager appointment uh, is about two years. Um, and yes, your interim manager is expected to devise an exit strategy uh, as early on as possible and then follow through with that strategy. Two years can still be quite a long time. Um, that said, your interim manager shouldn't really be making big decisions about the charity's future. Um, so, for example, it shouldn't be making, uh, without perhaps the engagement of the commission, I should say, but perhaps shouldn't be making decisions about charitable investments. Um, if it's a grant-making charity, perhaps making large grants of charitable funds. Um, 
but the commission's uh, the manager's powers are quite wide ranging so they may be that they are able to sell assets if it's necessary to secure the financial position of the charity um, managers can also be given the express power to wind up the charity or they could rely on the powers to wind up the charity contained in the governing documents and then rely on the fact that they are conferred with the powers and duties of the trustees uh, or of course your interim managers could approach the commission uh, for a discussion and then perhaps an order made under section 84b directing the winding up of the charity so interim manager powers can be quite wide ranging and uh, they can have a lot of bite to them because they can be exercised to the exclusion uh, of the trustees uh, finally, then, interim managers are also governed by the 1992 regulations, or their appointment is governed by the 1992 regulations. Uh, and the two important points from here uh, is that it's the Commission who is determining the amount uh, of the interim manager's remuneration. Uh, and also, the interim manager's remuneration uh, is usually payable out of the income uh, of the charity. Now, there are some exceptional circumstances where the Commission might indemnify an appointment. Uh, and that would include circumstances such as where the charity doesn't have sufficient income to cover the fee uh, or if it doesn't have sufficient unrestricted funds to cover the fee. But the standard position uh, is that the fee is to be paid out of the income of the charity. So those are the powers and those are interim managers specifically. The next question that arises is when can these protected powers be exercised? Uh, and so this is when we go back to the preconditions. Uh, in section 76.1. And so 76.1 provides that those sub three powers apply uh, at any time after it's instituted an inquiry under section 46 with respect to the charity and the commission is satisfied of one of two things. Either that there is or has been a failure to comply with an order or direction of the commission, a failure to remedy any breach specified in a warning under section 75A, or any other misconduct or mismanagement in the administration of the charity. Or, so remember it's disjunctive, not conjunctive, so or B, it's necessary or desirable to act for the purposes of protecting the property of the charity or securing a proper application for the purposes of the charity of that property or a property coming to the charity. Uh, so we can see it's a two-stage test. You must have your section 46 inquiry on foot and then either uh, one of A or B, you don't need to meet both. Uh, and it's also important to remember the wording of 76.3, so it said, remember, the Commission may do one or more of the following. Uh, so it's a discretionary power, uh, and it must be a proper and lawful exercise of the Commission's discretion uh, to exercise its protective powers. So it's not just a case of the tick box exercise, yes, we've met one A or one B, you must also be able to say it's a proper exercise uh, of the discretion. Now, most cases are placed on the footing uh, of misconduct uh, or mismanagement of the charity. Now, realistically, most of the acts or omissions uh, complained of as being either misconduct or mismanagement probably also satisfy some of the other uh, aspects uh, of limb A uh, and probably satisfy, uh, and if not always, uh, aspects uh, of limb B at section 71. Um, and as we know, you only need to fulfill one or the other. Uh, and therefore, I think that's probably why most cases are put as misconduct or mismanagement. They're quite wide terms. Um, so therefore, very much is turning on the definitions of misconduct or mismanagement. And it's very important to know what those terms mean, because it's then that the powers in section 73 are engaged, or they're the gateway to the section 76.3 powers. Um, so the important points on the definition of misconduct or mismanagement are firstly that there is no statutory definition of the terms. Um, we know from the Scargill and Charity Commissioner's case, this is a decision of Mr Justice Newberger, as he then was uh, in 1998, misconduct and mismanagement are ordinary English words and should be given their ordinary English meanings. Um, now, you probably have heard of, uh, even if you're not entirely familiar with the Mount Star, case from the first tier tribunal so you might notice this is the cup trust case uh, and the first tier tribunal here were looked very closely at the case law and the guidance on what amounts to misconduct and mismanagement uh, and in particular it's paragraphs 136 uh, to 139 
uh, that are very interesting and helpful and which you would need to have a look at. Um, wall of text incoming. Here we go. Section 136, uh, sorry, paragraph 136, we've already covered. So reference to the Scargill case, mismanagement and misconduct being ordinary English words. Uh, 138 then, the important point here, the acts or the several acts or omissions complained of in their totality must be of some substance to justify the appointment of an interim manager rather than the alternative, which would involve the use or some, or sorry, of some or all of the other statutory tools within the commission's armory. The commission's guidance may provide illustrations of what might constitute misconduct and mismanagement, uh, but cannot restrict their ordinary meaning. So you've probably guessed Mount Star is a case about interim managers, hence these uh, points being framed in the context of interim managers. Um, but the general discussion of mismanagement and misconduct holds good for all of those section 76 powers and indeed 79 and 84 B. Uh, and 138 is very important because it's telling us that we must pass a certain threshold for an interim manager appointment. Uh, and also we should be having regard to the commission's guidance as to what amounts to misconduct and mismanagement, uh, but that this guidance will not be determinative. Another wall of text incoming, paragraph 139. Uh, paragraph 139 is important because it tells us that it's a question of fact and degree to be viewed in the overall context of each case, whether the acts or omissions complained of would constitute mismanagement or misconduct. And then importantly, it goes on to say, in our view, it would encompass a failure by the charity trustee to act as an ordinary prudent man of business, both in terms of process and substance. If the process is adequate and the decision reasoned, it may be rare for the commission to challenge the decision per se. So here we've got reference to the failure to act as the ordinary prudent man of business. And this should ring the bell because we would remember, ah, this is the trustee's duty of care. Uh, now codified as we know in Trustee Act 2000. Um, or if you've got an incorporated charity, char uh, the Companies Act 2006. Um, probably, uh, if not certainly, doesn't just stay uh, in the context of the trustee's duty of care. And especially if you've got an incorporated charity, you would imagine misconduct and mismanagement uh, could be proven or could be shown uh, if there's a breach of any of the uh, trustee duties, uh, including those at sections uh, 171 through to 177 of the Companies Act, uh, if you've got an incorporated charity. Uh, so in one of the earlier walls of text, section paragraph 138, you might have remembered there was a reference to commission guidance being instructive, uh, if not determinative. So what does that commission guidance say? Um, well, in Mount Star, it was cited as being misconduct includes any act or failure to act in the administration of the charity, which the person committing it knew or ought to have known was criminal, unlawful or improper. Uh, and mismanagement includes any act or failure to act in the administration of the charity that may result in significant charitable resources being misused or the people who benefit from the charity being put at risk. Um, now, the current version of the operational guidance uh, is at the link on the slide, and you'll get the slides uh, at the end of the presentation if you want to click on it. Um, for the moment, I ask you to take my word for it, that the guidance is slightly different, uh, in, or at least this current operational guidance is slightly different to that which appears uh, in Mount Star. Uh, and actually, one of the notable things in the current guidance is that it removes uh, references to omissions. It only includes uh, positive acts. So those are the principles. What has the first tier tribunal held uh, amounts to misconduct and mismanagement? Uh, well, these are the, some of the examples that I've pulled out of the FTT cases. Um, unmanaged conflicts of interest, that can amount to misconduct or, or mismanagement in the administration of the charity. Unilateral trustee decision-making, so either if you've got one trustee of the body uh, making decisions on their own uh, or making decisions without the benefit of legal advice where it would have been reasonable uh, to obtain advice. Uh, failures to comply with Section 15 action plan. So as you may know, under Section 15 of the 2011 Act, the Commission uh, can issue action plans to charities uh, with specific action points to help improve governance or uh, other specific issues. If you fail to comply with one of those, that could be mismanagement or misconduct. Uh, failing to act in accordance with the charity's governing documents. Uh, if you've got charitable funds that are unaccounted for, that probably also, uh, or certainly would also meet 1B. Um, various accounting anomalies, 
depending on the circumstances, uh, you might be able to say, actually, that's not misconduct and mismanagement by the trustees, uh, but some sort of negligence, perhaps by a professional advisor, if it's down to your accountants, and it wasn't something that a lay trustee would spot. Um, risk to charitable funds uh, and failure to minute trustee decisions. These are all things that have been held to amount to misconduct or mismanagement in administration of the charity. So that takes us to part three. If you do not agree, how do you go about challenging? Um, so as we already said, these powers can have quite strong consequences uh, for charities uh, and trustees. Um, so remember 76.3 provides for suspension of trustees uh, and also the appointment of interim managers uh, to exercise the functions of the trustee to the exclusion of the trustees. So they've got quite a lot of bite in them. Uh, and it may be that a charity or its trustees uh, would wish to challenge the commission's use of its protected power and ask the tribunal to have a look at it uh, and to see if it was a lawful exercise of the power. Um, if you do want to challenge, that is done by way of an appeal to the tribunal. So the protected powers or the use of the protected powers is not a reviewable matter, it's an appeal. And uh, we know that from the table in Schedule 6. We also know from the table in Schedule 6 that the, the appellants for standing would be the trustees of the charity, uh, the charity itself, if it's incorporated, any person who has been suspended, if it's a 76.3a that you are challenging, or any other person who is or may be affected by the order. Um, the tribunal's powers, uh, beyond just dismissing the appeal, uh, would be to quash the order in whole or in part, uh, and it could remit the matter back to the Commission if it were appropriate to do so. Um, it can also substitute uh, for all or part of the order any other order which could have been made by the Commission, or indeed it can add anything to the order, provided that thing could have been put in there by the Commission uh, in the first instance. If you are appealing the use of the protective powers, uh, section 319 sub 4 says that the tribunal must consider afresh the decision, direction or order being appealed against, and it may take into account evidence which was not available to the commission uh, at the time it made its initial decision. Um, so we know from section 319 sub 4 that this takes place uh, as a de novo hearing. Um, so the de novo status, uh, perhaps raises the question of where the burden of proof lays if you are challenging protected powers. Um, so is it with the Commission to show that the exercise of or the, or the gateway and the test for the exercise of the powers are met and that it was a proportionate response? Or is it for the trustee or the charity uh, to show the opposite? Um, and there has been conflicting uh, and quite frankly irreconcilable case law uh, on the earlier iterations of the legislation, uh, and also on the question of public law de novo hearings generally, uh, and other comparable statutory jurisdictions. Um, so this point was very much up for grabs until recently. So final slide, big wall of text, I will paraphrase. Um, the point was argued in full this summer. Uh, I must put my hand up and say, I argued it. I uh, said the burden of proof was on the Commission, um, the tribunal disagreed with me. So Knightland Foundation 2021 decision, it's in the FTT, uh, but it was Upper Tribunal Judge O'Connor, um, spent a long time in his written judgment considering this question because it had been fully argued uh, in written submissions by both sides. Uh, and he said, uh, in my view, unless Parliament has clearly spelled out in legislation to the contrary, it's for the appellant on appeal even an appeal in which there is to be a complete rehearing or where the tribunal must consider the decision afresh to demonstrate that the evaluative judgments and discretionary decision-making body, so in this case, the Charity Commission, uh, are wrong. He does go on to say that the weight to be attached to the reasons of the Commission is a matter for the tribunal to determine, bearing in mind that Parliament has entrusted the Commission to regulate the charity sphere. Um, so the, according to the FTT, at the moment, certainly, the burden of proof until someone argues otherwise somewhere else, the FTT is going to find that the burden of proof uh, is on the appellant charity or the appellant trustees, not the Commission. Um, so that is my whistle-stop tour of protective powers and how you might go about challenging them. And so I will hand over to our headline. Good morning, everyone. 
I'm Matt Mills, and like any self-respecting Chancery barrister, I'm going to start in the 17th century. In 1631, Mr Henry Fryer died unexpectedly after falling off his horse. This is his family too. Henry's the one in the middle. Henry's main asset was Halton Manor House. Now, obviously, the manor house is currently used for wedding venues, but back in the 1600s, the lands generated quite a big income, about £100,000 a year in modern money. Henry had inherited the manor from his father, who's the one on the left. The parents had disinherited Henry's older brother, John, in the strongest possible terms. In fact, the father spent half of his will criticising John's great impieties, horrible immoralities and other detestable misdemeanours too horrible and shameful to repeat. Unfortunately, John was a bit of a scoundrel. So when Henry suddenly died after falling off his horse, John hid Henry's will and took control of the manor house, which he felt was rightfully his. When John eventually died 40 years later, Henry's will was finally discovered by Henry's nephews, John's kids. Henry had left the residue of his estate to charitable uses for the good of the poor forever. Now, Henry's nephews had their eye on the manor, just like their father did. So they tried to argue that this gift was void for uncertainty. In the Court of Chancery, Lord Nottingham ruled that King Charles II could choose what should happen to the money. Now, Charles was known for his interest in social and educational charities. But in the 1670s, the Treasury was often unwilling to spend any substantial amounts of money on new schools. So what Charles II did is he directed that Mr Fryer's money should go to be applied for the benefit of the poor at Christ's Hospital School in London after it had recently been mostly burnt down in the Great Fire. Now, unfortunately, Charles II can't help you work out what to do with charitable gifts anymore. But the general problem I've described and the royal solution are still relatively commonly encountered. And that's what I'm going to talk to you about today. I'm going to discuss what's probably the most common problem which arises when charities are named as beneficiaries in a will. What you should do if the charitable legacy is uncertain or fails. Now, in theory, this shouldn't arise very often if wills, draftsmen and testators do what they're supposed to. Testators should keep their wills up to date and draftsmen should precisely identify the intended recipient of any gift. Now, this doesn't require much effort. A simple search on the Charity Commission's register will give you the official name, registration number and official address for any registered charity. And all you need to do is copy and paste that into the will. So that means if the name of the charity changes between the will being drafted and the testator dying, the personal representatives know who they need to give the money to. Unfortunately, these simple steps are not always done. In particular, homemade wills are a common source of confusion because testators frequently just guess the name of a charity they think they've heard of, or even worse, guess the name of a charity they think probably should exist, but they haven't checked. The most common example of things going wrong is simply writing, I leave money for cancer research. A quick search of the Charity Commission's database shows that there are at least a dozen charities that are substantial and active, which have the words cancer research next to each other in their name. So what should happen if your client or the testator in your case has done this? Well, there are actually eight ways of resolving this potential problem. For trivial misdescriptions, the personal representatives can simply make a decision and pay over the money to the appropriate recipient. Or if the gift is really to charitable purposes, rather than to a particular charity, the personal representatives can simply select an institution that falls within those purposes. Alternatively, they can ask somebody else for help. The personal representatives could ask the Attorney General to exercise the Royal Sign Manual procedure, or they could ask the Commission to make a scheme. Alternatively, the personal representatives could try and broker a compromise between the competing people who want the money. Or you could go to court either to seek an order authorising the personal representatives to rely on an opinion of counsel, or an order interpreting the will, or an order rectifying the will. So really there's a lot of options here for your clients, and that's what I'll spend the rest of this webinar going through, the law and practice of each of these options. The simplest solution is for personal representatives to satisfy themselves as to the testator's true intentions and hand over the gift to the selected charity accordingly. 
Now in practice, where there's a little bit of doubt, it's only usually appropriate to plow on if there's only one plausible recipient. For example, because the misdescription is so minor, it could only mean one charity. Maybe it's a spelling mistake, for example. In that case, the personal representatives may feel confident enough just plowing on. But the reported cases give us a little bit more guidance here. They've shown that essentially where the error was one of technical wording, the courts are very willing to allow personal representatives to carry on. For example, if the word vicar is used instead of rector, this doesn't affect the gift. Or if archdeaconry is used instead of diocese, that's also not a problem. This doctrine also applies if the incorrect description is so fulsome that the gift can only be to one charity. For example, a gift to the blind home Scott Street Keeley was, funnily enough, a gift to the benefit of the patients of the blind home, which was run by the Keeley and District Association on Scott Street in Keeley. That mouthful was simply consolidated in the will. Another example is that a gift to the Patagonian, Chilean and Peruvian Missionary Society was actually just a gift to the South American Missionary Society. But even if your client feels confident enough to take this route, the personal representative should consider trying to protect themselves against future complaints. And there are two possible ways of doing this. The first is to ask the recipient to give an indemnity to the personal representatives against any future claims by a disappointed third party. The other option is to ask the other people who aren't getting the money to agree to it going to your choice. Now, this agreement or this indemnity might not always be forthcoming, particularly when recipients are charities, but nevertheless, personal representatives could consider this. So that's option one. Option two has been suggested by the commission. It says, where a gift to charity has failed, but the executors are able to construe the purposes for which the property is held, a scheme will not be required and the executors can choose another charity carrying out those purposes. For example, this might be appropriate if the gift is for the relief of children with disabilities or for the Cancer Research Fund. However, as the Commission readily admits, there are three risks with this approach. Firstly, in some cases, it's far from simple to decide whether the gift is for a specific institution or for general charitable purposes. Secondly, following this option can sometimes put the personal representatives in a difficult position if they're forced to choose between competing potential recipients. And thirdly, there are some cases, although not many, in which the courts have still ordered a scheme even where the gift was for charitable purposes rather than a charitable institution. This suggests that at least some judges are uneasy about this option as a whole. But enough about courts, let's get back to royals. Technically, the royal sign manual simply means the signature of the monarch. So for example, this is the queen exercising the royal sign manual to give assent to the Australian Royal Style and Titles Act of 1973. But in charity law, the royal sign manual refers to the crown's jurisdiction to give directions as to how charitable property should be applied. Now the law is commonly traced back to Attorney General and Peacock in 1676, which concern none other than our friend Henry Fryer, who we heard about at the start of the webinar. And for about 300 years, the law didn't really change. Personal representatives could literally write to the monarch and ask him or her to decide what an ambiguous gift should be paid to. And he or she would literally write back signing their name and telling them what to do. On the 3rd of May 1986, the current Queen delegated this task to the Attorney General. So unfortunately, this means you apply now to the Treasury Solicitor, rather than popping a note in the side door at Buckingham Palace. But other than that, the rules are pretty straightforward. The Attorney General should apply the same principles here as the court would when deciding whether to make a scheme. So we're on familiar ground. Now, people like the Royal Sign Manual procedure because it's generally a quick, cheap and easy way to get an answer in an appropriate case. And in fact, about a million pounds of money is directed pursuant to this procedure every year. However, there is one very important limit to this doctrine. It's generally assumed that the Royal Sign Manual procedure can only apply to gifts. In other words, if the will leaves the testator's estate on trust for the executors to deal with, the procedure cannot apply. Now that ruling is traced back to the old and leading case of Mogridge and Thackwell. 
But in my view, there is some scope for a higher court to depart from this. And this is for four reasons. Firstly, the distinction Lord Eldon drew between gifts and trusts was not based on any clever legal theory or precedent. He was essentially plucking an idea out of thin air to try and rationalize what had been up until then, essentially a sea of inconsistent decisions. And even Lord Eldon admitted he couldn't rationalize all of the cases. Secondly, there are some reported decisions after Mogridge, which continued to invite the Royal Sign Manual procedure, even where the residuary estate was held on trust. For example, Attorney General and Fletcher. Thirdly, there's some limited evidence that the Attorney General has continued to this day to exercise the Royal Sign Manual procedure, even where the trust is purely administrative. And finally, the distinction between trusts and gifts has been criticized. For example, in the most recent case on this issue, Bennett in 1960, Mr. Justice Vasey said it was a curious thing to divide gifts and trusts this way. Similarly, Hubert Picarda has pointed out that a strict application of this distinction would essentially prevent the Royal Sign Manual procedure from operating in pretty much any case. After all, how many wills have you seen that don't have the word trust in them? Probably not that many. Despite these points, in my view, it's unlikely to be a proper use of estate funds to litigate this issue to the High Court or beyond, when there are so many other options open to personal representatives to resolve any uncertainty. So unfortunately, this means like that we're unlikely to see a reported case on this issue anytime soon. Final point on the Royal Sign Manual procedure, a Royal Sign direction does not protect the personal representatives from a later challenge brought by a third party who claims that they should have received the money. So although it can be a very useful procedure to get an answer, it's not perfect. And personal representatives should make sure they do, do their due diligence before they apply to protect themselves as much as possible. Fortunately, though, all is not lost if you're unable to rely on the Royal Sign Manual procedure, because if the assets are held on trust, then the personal representatives can consider applying for a scheme. Now, technically, there are two types of scheme in play here. On the one hand, if the legacy initially failed, for example, because the charity simply never existed, then we're talking about a C prey scheme under Section 67 of the Charities Act to vary the purposes. On the other hand, if the legacy only subsequently failed, for example, because the name charity ceased to exist after the testator died, then we're talking about an administrative scheme under Section 69 of the Charities Act, because the Commission in that case is not being asked to alter the purposes, it's simply being asked to define them. Now, in this context, the Commission generally wants to see two things before it will consider making a scheme. Firstly, you'll need to show the leg legacy can only properly be applied if a scheme is made. For example, the legacy was tied to the existence of a particular charity, or the description is so vague that the person representatives just have no real idea who it should go to, or there's no way of choosing between two equally competing recipients. So really, this is the question of, has it failed? And secondly, in cases of initial failure, so our first class, the testator needs to have a general charitable intention for the Commission to make a scheme. Now, the Commission's produced quite helpful operational guidance on both of these stages, and I'll take you through the key points now. Firstly, when deciding whether a misdescription gives rise to a failed legacy, which needs a scheme, the Commission will ask itself a number of questions. Is the misdescription simply a trivial error which can be ignored? That was the thing I discussed in option one, if you remember. Secondly, are there any instructions or words or clauses in the will which can help the Commission identify who the money should go to? Thirdly, is there any evidence that the testator supported a particular charity during their lifetime? Fourthly, has one of the recipients recently changed its name and the original name was closer to what was in the will? Fourthly, are any of the potential recipients known by multiple names? For example, an informal name, which is used in the will. Fifthly, can the recipient charity be found by a location or a purpose in the will? For example, a gift to the cat's home in Cardiff is clearly intended to go to whichever institution runs the cat's home in Cardiff. And seventh, can the name instead be read as a description of purposes 
For example, a gift to the trusts for preservation of our ancient churches might be a gift to the historic church's preservation trust. Finally, it's important to look in the will for any saving clauses, which might allow the personal representatives simply to pick somebody else instead, if one particular gift might have failed. So classic examples of failed gifts, as I've mentioned, involve legacies to charities which simply never existed. But these practical questions can help you and will help the commission work out if your case also is a failed legacy case. The second stage was general charitable intention. And you may remember I said that only applies in cases of initial failure. But what does that phrase mean, general charitable intention? Well, the closest we get to an official definition was given by Mr Justice Buckley, and he said it's a paramount intention on the part of a donor to effect some charitable purpose which the court can find the method of putting into operation, notwithstanding that it's impractical to give effect to some direction by the donor which is not an essential part of his true intention. Now that's quite a wordy circular lawyers type phrase, but fortunately in practice, the commission will ask itself two practical questions. Firstly, is the intention to benefit charity such that the only thing that's gone wrong is mechanics? And secondly, was it more important for the testator that the bequest went to a general charitable purpose or to a specific charity? So those are the key points. And in answering those questions, again, the Commission will look at a series of practical things. For example, it will closely consider the description of the gift. For example, is it just one charitable legacy among many? It will also consider the nature of the gift. For example, do the name and purpose point to a specific recipient rather than a, a general purpose? Or is the gift inherently linked to a purpose? For example, because it's to an unincorporated charity which ceased to exist. And thirdly, can you get any help from the residue clause in the will? For example, is the residue divided between any charities or do charities not feature at all there? If the person representatives think they can make a good case, then they can apply to the commission for a scheme relatively cheaply and easily. However, please note the commission will expect the personal representatives before they apply to consult with any third parties who might otherwise inherit if the legacy fails. So don't forget to contact the relevant people who might be residuary beneficiaries or alternative beneficiaries before applying for a scheme. In some cases, though, you may only have a couple of possible charities who could take a legacy. For example, there may only be two religious institutions of a particular domination in the relevant area. If there are only a couple of options, it appears to be possible for the personal representatives to negotiate a compromise between the potential recipients using the general power to compromise in section 15F of the Trustee Act. Now where the gift is small or the charities get on, this can be a relatively easy way to avoid any kind of application and can avoid any later complaints by the disappointed claimant because you can effectively split the money between them. However, the Commission will not officially sanction any compromise agreement, so it is on the personal representatives to make sure they do this correctly. When making a decision under Section 15F, the personal representatives are subject to the standard duty of reasonable skill and care. And as always, the more sophisticated the client, the more the court and the commission will expect them to do in their role. But beyond that, the personal representatives have generally quite a wide discretion here. So this can be quite a practical way of solving a problem. For example, if the gift itself is very small, it would just be uneconomic to pay for some kind of opinion or application, Splitting a thousand pounds between two charities might be the practical answer here. But if all of those five options fail, you can look to the court for some help. Section 58 of the Administration of Justice Act 1985 allows the High Court to make an order authorising a personal representative to take steps in reliance on an opinion provided by counsel on the meaning of a will. Now, the advantage of this procedure is that it avoids the need to attend a fully disputed hearing. But don't forget the court does have the power to order a fully disputed hearing if it thinks the issues are finely balanced, so it won't always get you out of the full costs. But if you can get an order under Section 48, it will protect the personal representatives from any claim for breach of trust later down the line. But it won't protect the people who receive the money from any claims by disappointed third parties. 
So personal representatives might want to think twice about using this option if they are aware of any difficult third parties who might cause problems for the receiving charities. Our seventh and penultimate option is to apply to court for a declaration on what the ambiguous provision in the will means. Now, although the Commission might and sometimes will offer a view on what it thinks the will means, it cannot give you a definitive legal interpretation. Only the court can do that. Now, this is not the place for me to give you a detailed talk on how to interpret wills, so I'll just mention three key points. Firstly, the courts essentially take the same approach to interpreting wills as they do to interpreting contracts. So in short, the aim is to understand or identify the testator's intention by interpreting the relevant words in their documentary and factual context. This is sometimes referred to as the armchair principle. Secondly, the courts have persistently said that they'll try to uphold charitable gifts wherever possible. In other words, this means the courts will often give a benevolent construction to a badly drafted gift to charity, because everybody loves charity. Thirdly, the court may consider extrinsic evidence if a will is meaningless, ambiguous on its face, or ambiguous in light of certain other evidence. And if you can prove one of those points, then you can file certain very helpful evidence. For example, you could put in evidence that the testator was interested in or they subscribed to a particular charity, or that one of the potential receiving charities is based closer to where the testator lived, or that one of the receiving charities simply didn't exist when the testator lived in that area, so this couldn't have been their intention. These types of practical points, which are relatively easy to establish if you know a relative or friend of the testator, can really help tip the balance in the interpretation of a will. Our final option to resolve any uncertainties in the will is to ask the court to rectify it. Again, I don't have time to go through rectification in detail, but as I'm sure you're all aware, the court has the power to rectify a will by section 20 of the Administration of Justice Act 1982. And as Mr. Justice Chadwick explained in the famous Sagelman case, there are three key questions for the court to consider in a rectification claim. What were the testator's intentions for the particular gift? Does the will fail to carry out those intentions? And crucially, was this because there was either a clerical error or a failure by someone to understand the testator's instructions? Now in rectification claims, the court can consider extrinsic evidence of the testator's intentions. So it's really important to get a copy of the will file if you can. But it can also be useful to find the evidence I was talking about a minute ago, about charities that existed, for example, when the testator was alive. A useful case in this context is the decision in Re Hart. There, the testatrix had left a gift to the West Berkshire Ambulance Hospital, but it gave no address and no registered charity number, and no such charity existed. As Judge Hodge pointed out, this was a bit of a nonsense gift because ambulances clearly don't need hospitals. People need hospitals. More importantly, though, there was evidence in the will file showing that the testatrix intended to benefit an air rescue charity in the West Berkshire area. So in light of these points, the judge was willing to rectify the will. So instead, the money went to the Thames Valley and Chilton Air Ambulance Trust. If you are considering this option, and it is probably the most extreme, there are two other key points to bear in mind. Firstly, as you may know, the limitation period is short. It's six months from the date on which the grant of probate is taken out, so really don't delay here. And finally, if the rectification claim succeeds, the personal representatives may have a good argument that the professional draftsman who's to blame should pay the costs of the claim. So that can be one way of recouping the legal fees and other costs incurred in dealing with an ambiguous will. So as you've seen, personal representatives really have a lot of options open to them for dealing with a difficult charitable legacy. So I've got uh, one key question here from Anissa, and it says, where there's been a subsequent failure, whereby the charity was removed by the commission, can the executors apply to the commission for the gift to be applied to a charity whose purposes are different to that of the one that has ceased to exist? Now, in my view, the, the answer to every legal question is, it depends, doesn't it? But here's what it depends on. If the charity that's been removed was the only one that does that specific thing, so we're talking niche charities here, then effectively we've now 
got no charities that operate within that specific purpose and you will need to apply for some kind of scheme to apply it for something that's as close as possible to that purpose. But if the charity that's been removed is just one of many, say it's a cancer research charity, then in my view, you might struggle to persuade the commission to allow you to apply the money for some completely different purpose. Because if there are 11 other cancer charities out there, why would the commission say, sure, you can apply it for lifeboats? So that's why I say it depends. It depends on basically how many charities operate within the original purposes of the gift. Brilliant. Well, I think uh, well, it falls for me to say thank you, everyone, for joining us this morning. Thank you. Bye bye.